Good afternoon. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, continue our study of the Gospel of John. Now, um, if you've been following, you'll note I finished up John chapter 5 um, this past Friday online. And so we're going to just pick up here in John chapter 6. So please turn to John chapter 6. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day, this time. Lord, we thank you for this ability to be able to dive into your word. Lord, I pray that you would please teach us by the power of your spirit, that you would guide us, you'd strengthen us. Lord, you'd teach us, you'd convict us. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. So right on the heels of... Last week's uh, message, uh, not in word only, but in power, uh, we take a look at uh, examples of the Lord as uh, we see that he wouldn't just say something, but everything that he would say, he would prove it. He would do a physical example. We'd see the power of God goes hand in hand with the word of God, that the Lord says it, and therefore it's true, and it has power, it has life. My words, they are spirit, they are life, as the Lord says. So holding on that, we see uh, all down through, uh, especially on the message on this past Friday, uh, wrapping up from uh, John 5, verses 30 to 47, uh, Jesus arguing with the Pharisees, and they accusing him and not believing who he is because he had said that God was his father, and they got mad because that, as they said, makes you equal with God. And he goes on to explain to them, but these things I say that you might be saved. It, so he shows them all the signs, the wonders, the proves these things, the name claims, all these things. And, it, and he accuses them and shows them how they are lost. As we see in verse 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. So uh, again, directing them to what they need to do because they call themselves the keepers of the word. They call themselves the servants of the Lord. Well, they need to educate themselves. So wrapping that up, his arguing with the Pharisees, we get down to John chapter 6, verse 1. And after these things, his debate with the Pharisees. And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Okay, so... Many people will follow the Lord for many different reasons. And we see one here is these folks followed him for the power, not word only. As we see, uh, some people get really focused on the word, but they deny the power thereof. Other people get so focused in, on the, the miracles that God is able to do, but they don't focus on the word. There needs to be the balance. There needs to be a proper balance and understanding. There needs to be a searching, a sitting at the feet of Jesus to really educate ourselves as to what the faith is. That yes, there is great power, but, it, but there must be understanding and interpretation of the power through the word of God. That the scriptures are, uh, are uh, the rule, as the standard at which we go to, to understand how God works, to understand how God moves in all of this. That if he says it, it's absolute. Well, how does it work? How does God work? Well, this is what it says. We, we couple the two. The two are not exclusive. They go hand in hand. But these, these multitude, this multitude followed him because of the miracles. They had heard that he is able. They had seen what he can do. And that's what drew them. But they weren't listening to the words. We see Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And so, uh, verse 4, and the, and the Passover of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he, he then saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, if you correlate this with other accounts in the other Gospels, I forget which one it is, but it talks about, it says how the cities, they came out of the cities. Now, these, this is a massive, massive deal. Uh, this would have spread, the news of this would have spread when you have multiple cities emptying out to come see Jesus. And you would, uh, you'd be sure that the Romans would be really keen to know what is going on. So this is one of the things I talk about how, how everybody knew who he was. 
that the movies, the shows, never do this justice. I never really ex uh, explained this very well. But uh, for all these cities to come out, all the Sanhedrin would have been aware of this. We see Pontius Pilate, all the Romans would have been aware of this. That, uh, all the news of this spread. We even see another passage that shows the Greeks came down to see him because the fame of Christ went through all the land. So, when Jesus lifted up his eyes, saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, even though all of these coming and following him because of the miracles that Jesus said, says, uh, says you only follow me because of the miracles that I do because you, you, uh, your bellies are full. The only reason you follow me. But we see the mercy of, of Christ though looking upon this multitude. He didn't tell them to get lost. He didn't rebuke them because of their not understanding, because of whatever weird views they had. But we see a great mercy for the Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And we see the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So we see his even showing uh, grace, tempered grace and mercy upon them as he wants them to be saved. As we see over in, uh, in verse 34 of chapter uh, 5, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He wants them to understand. He wants them to keep coming after him. He wants them to keep searching. He wants them to keep thinking. To keep putting the pieces together. To really truly understand who he is and what is going on. So we see again and again examples of the Lord. The lengths that God will go to save a soul. The lengths that the Lord will go. We even see uh, the one uh, Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. Jesus agreed to meet in secret because Nicodemus wanted to know that the, 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 what the, that the Lord, if you are searching, he will come. He will show himself. He will show himself. And, and even in the quiet, in secret, he met with Nicodemus to show him so Nicodemus could understand and Nicodemus could be saved. To even, we see great public displays like this is going to be. Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said, verse 6, And this he said to prove, prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, this verse right here is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because in really searching and studying this verse right here, the proving of the faith, the proof of the faith here is in Christ and tr who he truly is. And when you understand the power of God, like I talked about last week, the power of God, there is such peace, there is such understanding that I don't have to worry about anything because the Lord knows exactly what to do in all things. That, that, but he allows examples and things to come up to see what, what are you going to do about this? Are you going to try to figure it out yourself? Are you going to try to twist your mind and lose sleep and pull out your hair and scheme and fret and be anxious and doubt and try, and try to take the power and authority in yourself? Or are you just going to surrender it to him? See, for he himself knew what he would do. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 for a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, for it is written, it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searched all things, yea, the deep things of God. That the Lord already has the answers. He already has the solutions. He already has it all worked out. He's just waiting for us to ask. Ask and you shall receive that which he has already prepared. Seek and you will find the answer that he's already uh, has in his hands. Knock and it shall be opened to the storehouses that he's already filled this is what the Word of God says. I don't need to worry, fear, doubt, be anxious of anything. The proper answer to this, as he, Philip says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. He tried to figure it out himself. 
The proper response of what Jesus desired was, and Jesus says, says well, what sh how, how can we feed these? What he should have says, I don't know. What do you think? Lord, what do you say? Lord, what's your plan? Lord, what do you want us to do? But Philip tried to figure it out himself. And see, proper faith is refusal to panic. Proper faith is trusting in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That's what scripture says. It's only when we try to take the authority, take, take the onus upon ourselves as we will find confusion, fear, unbelief, anxiousness, and all of this. For he himself knew what he would do. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. <clears throat> there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And this is another one of the verses that has actually saved my mind in, in so much and really helped me in learning to trust in the Lord. That he flat out says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that, that he knows our limits. He knows the end of our rope. He knows how far we can be pushed. He flat out says he will not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, but he'll make a way of escape. He, that, that he'll allow you right up to the edge, but he, won't, he will never push you over. He will never allow you to go beyond. That if we do go beyond, we've taken that step ourselves. We've taken that step ourselves. as Because we have marched off the edge. We have let go due to our own reasoning. But it says that if, that if we trust in him with all our heart, he will direct. He will show you. He will, he will pull you back. That he will direct. He will, not, he will not allow you. But sometimes we allow it ourselves. You see that? So with this, the trust in the Lord here, another example that Christ is giving here to learn to trust him, to look to him, that when we don't see how it's physically possible, that's when he does the supernatural. That's when he does the supernatural. He teaches this, he says this, this is what it says. Let's go to Mark 11. Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> See, Philip was doubting. Philip was scared. Philip was worried. Philip was stressing. He had no idea. He started to panic here. You just, ah, uh, because now he feels pressure because the Lord is asking something of him. So he feels, oh, I got to figure it out then. How am I supposed to do this? That's not, what he's, that's not the point that Jesus is trying to teach. Because look, look what the Lord Jesus says here in Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Not faith in your ability to handle it. Not in your faith, not in your, your faith of your strength, of your reason, your intellect, of your life experiences, of your logic. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. what Jesus said. And we go back here to John 6, verse 6. And this he said to prove this is a test of faith. This is a test of faith is what this was. Because Philip has been shown so many examples in word and deed, in word and in power. So many examples here. So, But it's uh, this is how the Lord works. He works in the, the, the knowledge, the training of word, and the theory, and now we see the practical, the hands-on. Okay? You've been told about faith. You've been instructed about faith. Now put it to practice. Put it to practice. I've shown you how to do it. Now do it. 
And this he's, for he himself knew, Jesus knew the answer. He knew how to handle this. Philip says, well, 200 pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which, have, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to presume upon the text here just for a moment. Now, I've written a poem a while back about the ballad of uh, uh, the ballad of uh, the little boy here, um, where I used my own imagination, uh, uh, sitting myself there and watching this scene unfold. I have a very imaginative mind. Um, and I just kind of watched this scene unfold as I'm reading through and picturing these individuals. Now, you see the sea of all the people. All there, tons and thousands, thousands of them. And Jesus with his disciples up on the, the hill here. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says there's a little boy here. Now, who is this little boy? First, we need to set the scene. Now, this boy, this clearly wasn't this boy's lunch. That's a lot of food for a little boy. So is the theory. Some little guy's going to sure eat a lot. But uh, it says, there's a lad here. This little boy here has five barley loaves and two small fishes. Now, in my mind, how I see this is this boy was close enough to hear Jesus ask this question. How can we feed these? And Philip's like, well, I don't know. We don't have enough money. And, I, and how I see it, the little boy says, well, well, Jesus, but we have this. Because what did Jesus say a while back? Faith of a child. I personally believe, my own theory, that this was set up by Christ, but this boy was directed by the Spirit of God to chime in this here as, as a application, hands-on physical example of what Jesus is talking about faith of a child. Because Philip clearly didn't. Philip didn't. Philip feared and tried to figure it out by physical means. But this boy sees all the crowd, doesn't doubt, because he knows what Jesus is able to do. Well, Jesus, I have this. So Andrew, son of his brother, says there's this lad here which has, has this. And, but he chimes in, but what are they among so many? Just no faith of a child. No simple believing faith. Simple believing faith. There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. What are they among so many? Now what, is, what does Jesus say right there to this wavering of faith to this shaking of mind and soul where they just this confusion and this fear they can't figure it out now it's really bugging them how are we supposed to do this because jesus asked us so there's pressure we got to figure this out what are we going to do what does jesus say sit down sit down be quiet shut up sit down stop the confusion stop the panicking stop the pacing stop the fretting sit down at my feet Jesus says sit down because what does the scripture say be still and know that I am God to stand still and see the mighty salvation of your Lord to be still sit still be calm for he gives us not the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind power love of Christ soundness of mind and Jesus says, sit down. Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the, so the men sat down, a number of about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. He took this little bit of food that this boy had given. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. Now, I have racked my mind trying to imagine what that would have looked like. I guess it doesn't say, so there is an aspect of speculation that you can make and theorizing. How would that have worked? Did he have like a piece of bread and just break it off and just it just kept breaking off? Or 
And if you have the basket that he kept reaching in, it just the basket just did, didn't empty. I believe that one. You know why? It, it, it tracks. The barrel of meal will not run out. The basket will not run out. The jar of oil will not run out. That when you trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding, the barrel of meal will not run out. The wisdom, the guidance, the blessing, the answers, the direction, the miracles, the power will never run out. Because that's what he says. It doesn't matter what the situation is. This physical world is putty that is molded by the hands of praying faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Back in the Old Testament, now I, I believe it was Eli, no, it wasn't Eli, it was Elisha. I think it was Elisha. <clears throat> this one account where the lumberjack, as a wood, woodsman, was chopping the tree and the axe head flew off into the river. Okay? Flew off into the river. He had no idea what to do and he panicked and he ran and grabbed, uh, grabbed Elisha and said, said Master, well, what do I do? For the axe was borrowed. And I can't get the axe head and I don't know what to do. And Elijah says, well, show me the place. He goes there. Now, it says that when Elisha saw the spot, he went and cut off a branch and threw the branch in the water. And the iron axe head floated. Now, we're left with two thoughts on this. Either that's a bunch of nonsense, or it actually happened. Iron doesn't float. Tree branches don't make iron axe heads float. What was the tree branch? An act of faith. Because God told him to do that. The Lord says, if you obey me, you obey, even if you don't understand, you obey me, I will do it. Those who honor me, I will honor. I personally believe what the branch was, was the test of Elisha. To fulfill the blessing, the answer of the request. Now, iron axe heads don't float, but what we see here is the power of God over the physical. That he is able to multiply the bread and the fish. He's able to make the iron axe head float. He's able to heal the sick, raise the dead, part the sea, knock down the wall. He's able to cause, cause a raging inferno, not even touch the skin or the clothes of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is able to alter the laws of physics. But how often do we come to the faith, we try to interpret the will of God through physical means, through physical reasoning and physical logic through our own thoughts, of our own processes. Well, that doesn't make sense. It just doesn't always happen. But he says, whatever you desire. Why do we put limitations on the power of God? Now, we would look at that crowd, and many of, in our minds, we see them, even the minds back then, no different. Nothing's new under the sun. But it's no different. We'd look at the crowd, and we'd start to panic. Well, how am I supposed to feed them? How am I supposed to feed them? You're not. How am I supposed to bring the message? I'm not. How am I supposed to fulfill X, Y, Z? I'm not. Because the works of the righteous is the works of the Holy Spirit of God, not me. It's not my works. It's not my works, not my ability. It's not my hands, my feet. Because I'm the living temple of God. He's the power in me. All that is done is by Him, through Him, for Him, to all things. My job is to sit down. I like that one poster. Sit down and hold on. <laughs> Just sit down and hold on. Watch God work. And there's much grass in the place. What does Psalm 23 say? This shepherd on the hill is guiding the sheep to the fields. Much grass. Much grass in the place, so the men sat down, number about 5,000. It wouldn't matter if it was 5 million. Wouldn't have mattered. Jesus took the loaves. We cast our care upon him. We give all things to Christ. We hand it all over. We hand him the basket and everything. Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise are the fishes as much as they would. Now, here's a question. Any mathematicians in the, in the crowd here, 
How long would that have taken? You have 12 disciples. You have about 5,000 people that need to eat. So you're given some, you take it out, and you got to come back, get more, go out and give it out, come back, get more. How, how long would that have taken? Now you'll note, it doesn't say. You know why? Because the power of God is not hinged upon time. It doesn't matter how long it would have taken. It didn't matter if it was an hour. It wouldn't have mattered if it had taken a year. The power of God would have been the same as the first. So we see here that time is irrelevant. Now look at this. They didn't all were, they, it wasn't just they were all given a nibble. Verse 12, but that when they were filled, when they were filled. Go to Psalm 23 just for a second. <clears throat> Psalm 23. Let's, let's go back to the beginning here. Now, reminder, who is Jesus? Jesus is Almighty Sovereign Lord God manifested in the flesh, right? He's Jehovah God, God Almighty, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father in the flesh. Verse 1, the Lord, all uppercase, L-O-R-D, that means Jehovah God, Almighty God. The Almighty God is my shepherd, I shall not want, I'll be in want of nothing. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, sit down in much grass. Make me to lie down in green pastures, he leaves me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's all by him, not by me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Do you think that, that, that there were some uh, Pharisee vultures just kind of gawking in, kind of seeing what's going on? He couldn't care less what they thought. He prepares the table even in the presence of all the peers, all the deniers, all those that, that, that uh, are the skeptics of all these things. Don't worry what they say. They're wrong. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. They were filled as much as they needed. They were in want of nothing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Let's go to Isaiah 55 for a second. <clears throat> now it says, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. How did this miracle take place? Isaiah 55, 11. Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. But it's not going to be left in the field, purposeless, to mold and rot or whatever, that every single fragment, every single bit of the, of the declaration of the Lord, of the power of God, of the word of Christ, is going to profit. It's going to benefit every last crumb. Nothing remains. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. His word is preserved. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. How many disciples are there? Twelve. How many baskets? Twelve. What does it say? And they gathered them together. Twelve. Just so happened. Eh? Chance, luck, coincidence. 
just, just so happened that there was just enough left over that filled, filled 12 baskets specifically. What are the odds, eh? Ecclesiastes. You don't have to turn, but Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. What is Jesus? He's the water of life. They were fed with the bread and the fish. Bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Fish, which is a symbol of the saints, a symbol of the servants of Christ. And Christ is the living water. They cast their bread upon the waters. They gave the loaves to Christ. And guess what came back to them? You see how the word of God, how it all ties in, how the Lord has the answer for everything. We don't have to worry about anything. All we have to do is sit down, be still, be calm, trust in him with all our hearts, and not doubt in our heart. Now, that, now you'll note, just sidetrack on that. Mark 11 um, says, not doubting in your heart. So I've had so many people come to me and uh, or I talk about how the scripture says to not doubt. They're like, well, how do you stop the doubts? Uh, it says to not doubt. How, how, you, how can you stop doubts? Because it's impossible. You can't stop the doubts. I'm like, you're right. Like, but, but, but you said you're not supposed to doubt. You'll note it says not doubt in your heart. As you heard this morning, uh, uh, Pastor Paul is saying, which is very true, we see in Romans chapter 7, the difference between the body, like the flesh, and the soul that the flesh is corrupted by sin, the flesh is not saved, the flesh wars and lusts against the spirit, you cannot do the things you would, so that the mind is served the law of God, the flesh is served the law of sin, that the flesh will always doubt, the flesh will always fear, the flesh will always fight back with the fleshly mind trying to reason and think and try, trying to figure things out and settle things itself. Well, the flesh is incapable of perceiving and understanding the supernatural. The flesh cannot understand it, so therefore we'll try to excuse it and try to find other ways. But not doubting in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you see the belief of the heart, that I know what it says, I'm holding to that, I don't care what minds say, what the flesh says, what society says. Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost, but to trust in him. There, therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. Just so happened to be five, eh? Five's the number of grace. And just as David, when he was going to fight Goliath, went to the, went to the little stream and gathered five smooth stones. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. Number one, five's the number of grace, and by one application of grace, he felled the enemy. Also because Goliath had four brothers. Gather up the fragments that remain, nothing be lost. That the tr To trust in the Lord... This is, it's not a loss that you're not wrong. It's, you're never in error in trusting Christ and looking to him in all things to believe on his word because the enemy will try to twist the word as well. And I just heard an, an excellent uh, example of this. Uh, the great war that was a head-to-head -head with Jesus and Satan in Matthew chapter 4. What was it that they fought with? That they fought, they warred with each other. What were their weapons? Their fight, their war was over the word of God. Satan said, said this, and Jesus responded, it is written. Satan tried this, Jesus said, it is written. Satan says, it is written. Jesus says, it is written. The back and forth that the devil knows how to twist scripture, how to twist things, how to, how to alter it and change. But our job is to just sit still at the feet of Jesus, just take what it says and not try to, to figure it out ourselves. What does it say? What does the Lord say? Stop making excuses. Stop trying to find loopholes. Stop trying to bring in your own reasoning, your own interpretations. What does it say? Search the scriptures. For, then, for, for, for in them you think you have eternal life. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Test the spirits by the word of God. To be as a Berean and search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. What does the Lord say? He is able to do all things. With men it's impossible. With God all things are possible. 
Twelve baskets full. The bread came back. The blessing of God upon those that just trust him. That Jesus did not rebuke them for, for uh, them saying, trying to figure it out themselves. We see the peace of God. We see the grace of God. As he's, he's not a taskmaster. To not fear that, well, I did this wrong, so God's not going to help me. God's not going to hear me. God's not going to bless me. That's not how the Lord works. The goodness of God. They see the Lord even rewarded them. But, but, but they were wrong. They failed this proof, this test. Because the goodness of Christ. He wants you to see this. He'll show you. No, no, that's not quite right. Watch this. Sit down, watch me. Sit down, watch me. The lesson to learn is to not fear Christ. To not fear the, uh, fear the Lord as being like a taskmaster. But the holy reverential worship and respect fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Then those men, and those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And a lot of people will look at Christ, not quite understand. Again, many follow because of, of X, Y, Z. But again, like I said, you take the word and the power, the word and the power. What does it say simply on the page? What, does, what is Christ just telling you? What has he said before? If you, don't, if you don't remember, if you fail, if you fall flat on your face, what does the Lord do? He picks you up. The righteous man uh, falls seven times and rises again. It's not about the fall. It's about the getting back up. About learning to trust and walk in him. Let's go to Luke 6, 38. We're almost done. Luke 6. Luke 6.38. Now this little boy, this little boy that brought the basket with the bread and fish, gave it all to Christ, gave everything. He had nothing left over. Luke 6.38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for at the same measure ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now look at this. It's not that, it doesn't say, if you give, the Lord will just give you that back. Now the Lord says, hold out your cup. He fills it, packs it down, shakes it, it packs it down, puts more, and packs it down, shakes it all down, packs it down, running over. It's what it says right there. Good measure, pressed down down, shaken together, running over. Twelve baskets full. Now, we go back to the boy. Now, in my poem that I wrote about this, go back to John 6, about the boy, as I brought some of my own theorizing speculation upon this. Now, this boy, watching Jesus... Take the basket of bread and fish, multiply it in this miraculous scene, feeding all the thousands. Now, how I wrote it is, is that the boy, when it was all done, went running home. And placing myself on that hill, watching, I see Jesus elbowing the disciples, smiling, pointing the boy, Imagine the stories he's got now of me. The testimony of the power of God. Now imagine Jesus watch his little boy running home. Now, the, the, and now this boy saw the power of God taking what little that he had. All that he had to do was just carry this basket. All he had to do is just hand it to Jesus. All he was required to do. He did what he could with what he had. And the great blessing of the power here is get, given him the power of the word, the power of the truth, a declaration, go and tell what great things the Lord has done for you, just like Jesus said to the Gadarene. We see the tie-ins all across Scripture, so many things. Now, so many of these people, they had heard Jesus make the claims, they had seen the miracles that he had done, and again, some people just won't understand, just like at the beginning here. They follow because of the miracles. 
It doesn't matter what you say sometimes. Some people just won't get it. These men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is the truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. But again, we see Jesus coming back again and again. The long-suffering, the patience of God upon the minds of these Again, because he wants them to be saved. He was not going to allow them to enforce their will. They were going to follow his will, the will of the Father. We see Jesus did not come to establish an earthly kingdom, earthly empires, er an earthly society. He came for souls. The kingdom of God is within you. If my kingdom robbed this world, then would my servants fight. So he wasn't going to allow himself to be abused in that manner. He came for one purpose, one purpose only, that is to save men's lives, to save their souls. And he does this again by showing, not just in word, but in power. And just a simple example here, we see so many tie-ins across Scripture. I love this story. Again, it is... It, it really sparks the imagination to how would it have looked in how it would come out. I just, I've always been interested in that and knowing how exactly that would have come, come to be. But these things are written. This is sufficient. How, how this is written is sufficient for one purpose, one purpose only. That is to know and understand who he truly is. These things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and I believe in you, and I have life through his name. These things are written that you might believe. All, all, all that he has said and done here, that God has preserved. Some people are obsessed with more. They need more books, more stories, the lost years of Jesus or whatever, that these things are not sufficient for them. Would you keep bringing them back? The simplicity, the simplicity, the simple scene. Just sit down. He took the bread. He dispersed it. Well, what about this? How did this work? work? That doesn't matter. But I don't understand. All you need to understand is this was an example, a proof of his divinity, of his power, showing how the scriptures all correlate. He brings it all together because no one else could do this but God. Our Father, we thank you for this day, for this time. And Lord, just ask that you, you bless this. You'd help us to... to just be able to see more of this, Lord, uh, that your spirit would reveal these things to heart and mind. Lord, how your word all flows together, how it all comes out. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, give us the teaching, the understanding, the knowledge. And Lord, I pray that you would bless these things to our hearts and minds. And Lord, that you'd bless the remainder of this day. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray.